everybody, and I'm going to turn it over to Tim, who's going to give Molly a very proper introduction. So. Uh, Molly Crabapple is a hustler. Um, <laughs> She's been a hustler for a very long time. She hustled her way into the art world uh, uh, by doing a mixture of drawing for all kinds of unsavory things and posing for all kinds of other unsavory things. She, uh, from there, started the Dr. Sketchies, now franchise of uh, pretty positive life drawing, alternative coolness classes. Um, where I know her best and more recently is when she hustled her way into journalism, uh, starting uh, in 2011 by traveling to a whole bunch of places where things were kicking off uh, from Occupy to Greece to Madrid to all kinds of places. Uh, more recently she hustled her way into Gitmo, the third artist ever to be allowed into that facility and came back with some pretty amazing work both writing and art. I recommend you look into it. Um, and her latest biggest project came out of that 2011 summer of unrest uh, and I interviewed her about that a little while ago, and she said something to me that I keep quoting to everybody when I talk about art, so I'm going to quote it to you guys. Um, we were talking about how she finds a balance between activism and art and journalism and what those lines are. And she said to me, artists are the most lucky little foo-foos in the world. We spend a century excusing every possible hypocrisy and depravity with, but I'm an artist. A commitment to tell the truth above all else is often challenged when the truth is that your side is behaving badly. I think the best political art comes not out of movements, but out of individual humans aligned with movements that have kept their own sympathies, their irreverence, their curiosity, and their critical brains. Molly Crabapple. Hey guys, thanks for having me. So today I'm going to talk about art and photography. And what the point of doing art is in a time where every single person in the entire world has an NSA tracking device slash reality reproduction thing in their pocket. But first I'm going to tell you guys about the only two people who have ever gotten angry that I drew their pictures. The first person who got angry that I drew his picture was a religious fundamentalist in Fez, Morocco. I went to Fez when I was 19 with this sort of hallucinogen adled writer and the idea that I would learn to be an artist by just drawing on the streets. I was so horrified by the tour groups there, these people shoving their way through the souks, wearing large white sneakers and not bothering to learn any Arabic. And I wanted to have some way to show, oh God, I'm not like them. And so I would sit on the street corners and I would draw. And when you draw, you're doing a profoundly subversive act. You're doing something disruptive. Instead of merely consuming, merely taking, you're also producing and you're laying your own skills on the line so anyone can evaluate them. So when I sat in the street corner and drew in Fez, I made friends. Except for this one guy who came up to my sketchbook, looked at it, grabbed it out of my hand, and tore it into pieces. He did not approve of me drawing. The second person who didn't like my artwork was a New York City police officer. I was sitting in misdemeanor court with Matt Taibbi, and we were watching a procession of people of color being um, arrested and shaken down for money for grave crimes like riding their bicycles on the sidewalk. It was a miserable place, a total scam. And I sat there in the back drawing this sort of court officer who is as pink and stretched as a boil. And he stalked over to me and he said, what are you doing? I'm drawing you, I'm allowed. And he picked up my sketch pad, looked at it and he said, you were looking at me. Anyone who's looking at me means trouble. And he stalked off, he gave it back to me, but he stalked off. And the entire back row of these dudes having the most miserable day of their life all burst out laughing because that's what drawing does. Drawing can mock power, and it can please. Mm. I'm an artist, and I'm not like an artist in like a cool new media way, like probably a, a lot of you guys are. I'm an artist in the sense that I take giant pieces of wood and I smear colored pigment on them until I get an image that I think looks cool. I also am someone who does illustrated journalism which means that I go to places where things are kicking off and I use my sketch pad kind of like a camera. 
These are pictures that I drew in Zuccotti Park at Occupy Wall Street. I saw the media advancing this narrative that the people at Occupy were dirty, grubby hippies who couldn't get jobs, and I knew it was a lie, and so I used my sketchbook to show that. This is a picture from my book with journalist Lori Penny, Discordia, where we went to Athens and drew what life was like under the Eurozone crisis, and we drew the rise of fascism. And this is from my most recent series, where this summer I became the third artist ever to visit Guantanamo Bay. The guards have their faces replaced by smiley faces, because you're not allowed to draw guards' faces in Guantanamo. Basically, everyone in the world is ashamed to work there. And when someone tells me I can't draw something, I want to draw the censorship. So I grew up obsessed and jealous with photographers. Photographers were so cool, I thought. They got to hang out with models. They got to go to war zones. They got to use their camera as a way of interfacing with reality. And all artists got to do, I thought, was sit in their studio like monks and repeat their best work over and over and over again until they died. I longed for the days when artists had the domination on image making. Before, before cameras, any image that was ever made was made by an artist. Artists would draw at fashion shows, artists would draw at war zones, when a mine collapsed, when an elephant was taken into town, whenever there was anything that needed reproduction, artists drew it. This is a, a plate from Goya's series, The Disasters of War, which was his sort of howl of protest that he did over 10 years against um, the Napoleonic invasion of Spain. And I think this illustrates what art can do that photography can't, in that it can emphasize, it can editorialize, it can take things that probably, that never actually happened, but are the truth of what happened. This is another artist drawing from reality. When the Paris Commune kicked off, women were on the front lines you know, at a time when they were massively repressed, when they would never have been allowed to do this in their normal lives, but the Paris Commune was a free zone. Um, this is the illustrator Danielle Vierge drawing from life a woman guarding Hotel de Ville. <clears throat> Otto Dix, who was a talented young art student who got sent off to the front lines at World War I and saw his buddies get turned into slush in trenches and saw his brother die, did some of the most crushing and brilliant anti-war work. This picture of a veteran with skin grafts, it simplifies and distills the raw horror of what that is, of losing one's, of losing one's um, identity, one's interface with the world, in a way that I don't think a camera could. It takes only the essential and not the extraneous. Dix is an interesting figure because he exemplifies two things that artists do, which is that they go really dark places, and then, and then, as Tim quoted me saying, they're depraved little foo-foos very often. So Dix, while he started drawing the horrors of World War I, was also one of the most iconic artists of Weimar Berlin, and here he is drawing the dancer Anita Berber who was a cocaine-addicted cocaine, cocaine naked dancer who would show up at parties with a monkey wrapped around her shoulder. Even fashion before photography was the domain of artists. This was Kenneth Block drawing people as they entered Truman Capote's black and white ball. Everything that could be drawn by artists was. And I am jealous for this time. But the thing about photography that it has over art is that photography, at least you assume, is true. This is Goya's classic picture of rebels being executed by Napoleonic soldiers, but it never happened. He never saw it. He is drawing what he thinks it might have looked like. He's imagining the worker there. He's imagining the uniformity of the Napoleonic troops. That happened. That's the power that photography has that it's truth. But now the photography we deal with, 
while a lot of it is, you know, brilliant photojournalism and singular voices, a lot of it is also just stuff like this. It's your phone. It's the fact that everyone has camera phones and also everyone while they're using their camera phones is being surveilled by surveillance cameras. Every single bit of reality now that can be photographed is from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's trial by government cameras to the aftermath of drone strikes by Yemeni dudes with their camera phones filming their dead relatives. We live in a time where there are more images than there have ever been in human history. And where does that leave art now? For me, there are two symbols of global rebellion. The first is the Guy Fawkes mask, which comes from 4chan, but the second is the outstretched camera phone. I remember covering the Madrid general strike. It was midnight, and there is a giant roving picket of 10,000 kids who are smashing up banks with their bare hands. And this one kid, he was spray painting a window, and the security came, guard came out and punched him in the face. And this army of kids descended on him, but they weren't, they weren't going to beat up the security guard. No, they had their camera phones out. They were saying, we are not going to let you get away with this. You are going to be immortal. Your face will belong to the network. You will become a meme. You will never, ever be able to be anonymous again. That's the hope of the camera phone. It's accountability for people who haven't been accountable in protests. <clears throat> Even when there are images that came about traditionally, like this one by a Reuters photographer during the Occupy Gezi protests, the network eats them. The network takes every single image that gets resonance and spits it back out, transformed, often hours later. Here's the same image being used in a street protest. Um, Officer Pike, the cop who pepper sprayed the kids at UC Davis, formerly would have been an anonymous person, but the internet made him a meme. That's my drawing of him. Now, the flip side of our cameras, of our ability to view, is the government's ability to view us. We live under the unblinking eyes of CCTV cameras. Um, and soon, the line between you know what we're viewing and how they're viewing us becomes so blurred as to be indistinguishable because as we view things with these, that data is also shared with the government. The line of the citizenry looking outwards and the government looking at the citizenry has all become mixed. And in fact, some of the coolest art that I see is stuff that plays with this. This is a photographer who actually takes, fil takes stills from CCTV cameras and he paints them. It's taking the eye of the government and reproducing it by the oldest ways possible. But as photography is ubiquitous, the faith in it is starting to chip away. No longer do you, when you see a photo, do you think that it's true or that even if it is true, it's in the exact context that it was used. This photo was used by Kerry to justify strikes on Syria, but the only problem was that it was taken in 2002 in Iraq. Fighters of the FSA have been found to be showing um, video footage of people being beheaded by chainsaws. The, the only problem was that those people weren't being beheaded by Assad, by Assad, they were being beheaded by drug cartels in Mexico. This photo, um, also provided by um, a rebel battalion in Syria, you know, desperate for funding, um, announcing a new, the formation of a new battalion. It looks super impressive, but the guns are toys. Photos are not the truth, and they never were. And even when photos are, are real, even when they're absolutely indisputable, um, for instance, the murder of Oscar Grant by a police officer at Fruitvale Station, there are um, videos and photos of every single angle of um, you know, him lying face down while the police, while police officer shot him. However, that didn't matter. The police officer still wasn't charged with murder. 
because the photography and the videography was less important than the power structure. So the thing that I would ask myself was I would say, we live in a world where everything is captured, where I can take pictures easily, where you guys all can take pictures easily. What's the point of me drawing things? Isn't that just like archaic and self-indulgent? Am I am I being like a whittler? Like what what like what what, what possible significance uh, can there be to what I do? Or, or am I just like picking scabs? Is this just my personal compulsion? Of course, there's no real dichotomy between old hand-done art and new, you know new technologies. Art has always always absorbed the newest technologies. The giant paintings of the Renaissance were done on canvas, and the reason they were done on canvas wasn't just because, you know, just because it was cool or whatever, it was because uh, canvas were, was used for uh, shipping sales, and there was an abundance of it, and that let people paint big. Um, early Renaissance painters, they used um, the camera obscura, and later painters used the camera lucida to accurately capture reality. What I do is even when I'm doing something as old school as this pen and ink drawing here with all this splatter on it, I am heavily, heavily using technology. This drawing is of an anti-fascist protest in Greece. Um, There's a Pakistani neighborhood, you know, people minding their own business, they had stores, and then um, the local Nazi party, which is called the Golden Dawn, came in and said that they were going to smash up people's stores if they didn't, close, if they didn't leave town. And so this was a protest by... Um, local shopkeepers and people who lived in the neighborhood saying, you know, Nazi scum, we're not afraid of you. So me and Lori w went to Greece for Discordia and we took tons and tons of photos with our, with our, you know, little iPhones and we took tons and tons of sketches and we took tons and tons of notes. And then to get something like this, it was almost like we montaged all of that together. For this protest, Lori took a million photos of the crowds, of the faces of the signs. I later looked up the sort of signs that would be used at an anti-fascist demonstration like this. And you get a singular image that's actually a collage of a thousand influences that came to me through technology and through the network. When I was growing up, my mom was working as an illustrator. And one of the things I remember was she had these massive metal file cabinets that were full of clippings clippings of every single possible magazine illustration that she might want to use, of like what a cat looked like, what an elephant looked like, um, tons and tons of file folders of hands. You don't need that anymore. We never have trouble now figuring out what something looks like, and even that is a gigantic change brought by the internet. Again, this is a montage together street scene from Greece. One of my big projects the last year was Shell Game, which Tim spoke about, which were taking the revolutions of 2011, the Occupy protests, the Arab Spring, and trying to retell them in a language that was surreal, decadent, and allegorical, trying to make massive altarpieces to them, votives. This was the one that I did for Anonymous. But when I did these things, I wasn't just drawing out of my head. I was also researching them the way that a journalist might. I was bugging every single hacker or activist or scholar that I could speak to about the ways to get visuals right. Um, this one is about the Tunisian Revolution, and I interviewed the blogger collective uh, Nawat for this, whereupon they told me that uh, jazz, the term Jasmine Revolution was hideous Western branding, and to please make uh, no allusions to that. So these very old school pieces, these pieces of paint on wood, are really products of the network. So I was telling you about how once just the act of remembering what something looked like was precious, right? You would keep, you would hold that down. You would keep, you know, your stacks of clippings. This is a drawing by Rembrandt of the elephant Haksen. Haksen um, was paraded through Amsterdam and people were like, holy fuck, when are we ever going to see an elephant before? We, or when are we ever going to see an elephant again? We better run over there and capture this. It, the sight of what an elephant looked like was so valuable that even when Haksen was dead, famous artists were drawing her corpse.
Now, the image has become ubiquitous. My friend Paul Mason is a journalist who covers civil unrest, and he went to Occupy Gezi when everything was kicking off. And I, I so wanted to go because I had spent some months in Istanbul when I was younger, and I, I just wanted to be there, but I couldn't because I had to go to Guantanamo Bay instead. <laughs> and um, I really wanted to draw it. And so Paul was taking iPhone photos of Occupy Gezi, of which this is one, and then I was turning them into drawings. You'll notice the sign is different. I crowdsourced the translation on Twitter. But there are still places where cameras can't go. This is a picture from Guantanamo Bay, which is simultaneously one of the most surveilled and most censored places in America. In Guantanamo, every single cell has a camera that is round and not able to be covered and that is checked in on every three minutes. The, um, there are cameras over all of you know, the towers in KSM's courtroom. Every, there, are, there are tons and tons and tons of cameras. But even the location of these cameras is so secret that if I sketched them into a drawing, that drawing would be torn out of my sketchbook and confiscated. It's the ultimate place where the state looks at you, but you can't look back. I spent two weeks in Guantanamo on two different trips trying to draw the island. And what became most important to me was to draw the censorship. This picture is of an army medic whose job it is to force feed prisoners. They, they don't call it force feeding, they call it enteral feeding. And they say that it's a safe care that doesn't hurt. So he was demonstrating um, enteral feeding. I wasn't allowed to draw his face. So I gave him this blank mask. Similarly, I wasn't allowed to draw the prisoners. There's an idea at Guantanamo that the identities of the prisoners themselves, even though it's long since been leaked, even though they're all written about, but the identities of themselves, it's supposed to be classified. So when I finally drew the prisoners, which I did through layers of bulletproof glass and one-way mirror and fencing, I had to scratch out their faces. In the car ride home, or in the car ride back to my hotel, the press officer who was with me looked through my sketchbook to make sure that I wouldn't do anything that might indicate who was there. This is the uh, cultural sensitivity officer at Guantanamo, Zach. He doesn't allow his last name to be used. Similarly, he didn't want to reveal his identity. Another thing that we were banned from doing is drawing anything um, that they called camp layout, which meant more than two buildings, um, location of cameras, location of doors. So for a picture like this, I would just have to leave things out. The censorship of photography at Guantanamo is so complete that at the beginning of the press tour, they actually give you a, um, a PowerPoint presentation about uh, OPSEC operational security, they call it, where they show you the only three angles you're allowed to draw of um, half of the base. And by three angles, that's not like vague, loose angles. That's like between this flagpole and between this flagpole. So actually being able to draw it gave me something very rare. Another, another piece from the, uh, the trial of Chelsea Manning, where cameras were also banned inside. Now, there are also other reasons that people might not want to be drawn. This is a picture that I drew in Greece of protesters who were involved in the anti-austerity protests. The young man below is a very prominent video blogger there who currently has two large scars on his face from tangling with the Nazi party there, the Golden Dawn. And he is terrified of having his identity revealed. So I drew him holding his logo over his face. Maxence Vallad was a young protester in Quebec during the anti-tuition protests whose eye was um, shot out with a rubber bullet. And he, um, for a while, didn't feel comfortable having photos of himself because it, because it looked terrible. But he let me draw him. And also in Greece, 
the police wouldn't allow you to draw them and it was probably dangerous even to like look at them really closely. So this was another image that was half memory, half montage of what I could find online. And they actually did totally look like Rob Liefeld characters. <laughs> And then there are places where there are just no cameras. When I was arrested during Occupy Wall Street, I was thrown in a cell for 11 hours. And it is so boring to be in a jail cell. It is the most boring thing in the world. It's like boring to the point where boredom becomes torment. And all I had to do was scratch little drawings into the styrofoam cup they gave me of water and try to remember exactly what the jail cell looked like. This is my drawing of it from memory. In Joe Sacco's preeminent book of comics journalism, Palestine, a lot of it is taken up with the memories of Palestinians, of their detainment, of their arrest, of their interrogations, things that no camera would ever be allowed to see. Joe Sacco stole back from the rabbit hole and put on the page again. This is an image of Palestinians being interrogated. Artists can do that. They can take memories and they can make them real. They can make you see them again. And so this is something important. Access can be taken from us. The internet can be shut off. Your cell phone can be smashed. The camera app cannot work, but you can never stop people from drawing. Drawing isn't something that you do. It's not something you have. It's something that you are. This picture is uh, by David Cho. David Cho is now known as the dude who um, got paid for his Facebook murals and stock options and so got $160 million and is basically the richest artist around. But when he did these, he uh, was in Japan and got into an ill-advised fight with an undercover police officer that led to him being put in solitary confinement in a Japanese prison for a while. He had nothing to do, but he drew because that's what he is. He's an artist and he drew even with soy sauce and his own urine. He would draw. The act of drawing something sets it apart. This is the face of a Guantanamo detainee, Hisham Sliti, a young Tunisian, or he was a young Tunisian man who was arrested. Um, even though at this point we all know that he uh, didn't do anything except a lot of heroin when he was in Afghanistan. So he, this is Hisham Slidi's Red Cross photo. And it's an institutional thing, right? It's a guy, you know, in front of a wall. It shows who he is. But when I draw, drew him, I wanted to set him apart. I wanted to say, no, no, this isn't, this isn't just an interchangeable number in a system. This is someone special. I want you to remember who they are. And that's the point, I think, of realistic art in the infinitely captured world. We take these million twit pics and out of them we find the truth. We make that apt line that sums up reality. We need the chaos of multiplicity. We need raw data. We need everything. But we also need the singular and we need someone to dive in and to extract it. And that's what an artist can do. We need someone who can be stealthy and subtle, who can subvert convention and who can go where cameras cannot. I found that drawings like photojournalism distill the essential. They remove photo blur and accidents of lighting. But visual art, unlike photos, have no pretense of objectivity. They are joyfully and defiantly subjective and their truth is ultimately individual. Picasso's Guernica does not show what a body looks like after carpet bombing, but it does show a truth about the hideousness of war. Images have power. There's a reason why the cartoonist Ali Ferzat's hands were broken by the Syrian regime. In New Delhi, the caricaturist Asim Trivadi is currently charged with sedition, and Thomas Nast's illustrations helped bring down Tammany Hall. Images get under the skin. Images get past compassion fatigue. Images get to the raw edges of your heart. Thank you. And uh, now you guys get to ask me any questions about anything. Hey. So, um, obviously, I'm, I'm 
at some level you're making an argument about the singularity of the image as opposed to the sea of images. So it's, it's one thing I was interested in is you know, you're, you're making a, a parallel between image production by artists at a time when there wasn't the sea of images and image production by artists at a time there there is this absolute flood of images. And I guess one thing I was wondering about in that is also the, the parallels you would see now between how artists are trying to pull from that flood of images and how certain other <coughs> other more crowdsourced activities pull from the images, like the, the, the huge number of variations on the tear gassing of, at UC Davis that, that, that made that one image both multiple and singular. No, it's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, also, artists were always creatures of our age. Like, I, I use the internet um, because I'm a person who lives in the era where people use the internet to look up everything. So I, I use it as an artist, but I also use it as someone who wants to find steak in the morning to eat. Um, no, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that, yes, we, we take... We dive into this sea of images, we take out the singular, and then the sea of images takes that back. And it's this constant push-pull interplay that I think is so exciting and creative. Um, you mentioned the Guy Fawkes map. And the Guy Fawkes map, to my understanding, actually comes from Deep Sleep Vendetta. It does, yes. And it's David Lloyd's work in conjunction with Alan Moore. And I believe Moore gives uh, gives Lloyd, Lloyd figured yeah. that out. But it's also an image owned by Warner Brothers, which mm -hmm. is an image mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting to see all these different layers of rebellion and commodification all in that one particular image, which has become ubiquitous now. And then if you want to layer on top of that who Alan Moore is and what he's about, talks about his, his studies of black magic and becoming a mage and all of this kind of stuff. And also has a continuing series on a comics talking about <laughs> the political reality in the history of comic books. There's a lot of stuff all bundled up in there and you want to pick some of the thread? Well, Guy Fox is so interesting um, for a few reasons. I mean, first of all, there's Guy Fox, like who the actual dude was, right? Who... Um, as I, as I understand it, was not a dude who's, who any of us would find his political philosophy particularly inspiring or good. Um, then there's the Guy Fawkes of English caricature with, um, you know, festivals about ceremonially burning him and these, like, you know, kind of cheap, kind of cheap masks. Then, um, getting from that, you have Alan Moore and David Lloyd doing Vias for Vendetta and retaking the mask as a, um, a symbol of rebellion without really... But almost more as like the cartoon symbol of rebellion than the original guy Fo than who the original guy fox was then you have it being made into a movie and bastardized horribly I, I personally think and then you have um 4chan and anonymous taking that mask from the movie and bringing it out into the real world in protests and bringing it back to its original irl meaning of rebellion there are so many levels on the guy fox mask there's the um the he was he was an anti he was an anti uh, Protestant he he, 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 was, he was a Catholic he was a Catholic subversive so you have the Catholic I'm subversive uh, interesting so so you have like the Catholic subversive you have the Warner Brother branch lock you have um, English folk traditions you have comics canon and you have the um, the the um, anarchic dark heart of the internet all at once coming together to make this one visual symbol of modern protest that is everywhere from Brazil to Istanbul. Anonymous first used it in a protest against Scientology. They did, yes. So, so there's a subtle way of that as well. Exactly, it's like the the facial the the um the face of fuck you. I think is the best way to put it. Hang on, so in you know in the context of all of those layers. Um, how, how, do, how do these, um, you know, the, the, the kind of richly expressive, um, uh, uh, deeply subject, subjective images that you make um, find a way through all of that? Um, and you've talked a lot about um, using the network um, as, a, as a kind of repository of possible influence um, in terms of the kind of ex expanded canon of images that are available to interact with, and also, um, I think, you know, quite evocatively, um, to expand the network of 
friends and associates and, and, and comrades in arms, as it were. Um, but then when, when the image is produced, how does it find its light? One image that I did, which I never actually thought was a very good image, but it just was of the right moment, was when Occupy Wall Street first hit, they had no graphics except the really cool ballet dancer on the bull. And so I made a stencil of a vampire squid. And it was not very good. But um, I put it online and for high res, and I said, anyone who wants to take it can. And almost immediately, it started ending up on protest, on protest signs. Um, schlocky eBay stores started um, putting it on T-shirts so that um, you could get your own, what was it, like, like punk vintage tentacle shirt? <laughs> Matt, Matt Taibbi um, found it because it was based on his, um, his article, came into Rolling Stone with um, a big thing of DIY T-shirts he had made of it. And the image, the image had a life. Um, another image I did that I put up royalty free was I did um, a free Pussy Riot poster. And a week later, there was an Al Jazeera news piece called, which started out with some people will make money off of anything and focused on a really schlocky Russian design studio that was making up um, unauthorized t-shirts of my image. And they, they held them up and shook their heads. And, and I was like, but, but that's what happens. I mean, when you put an image out into the world, it gets, it gets stolen. It gets remixed. Um, Madonna tweeted my Pussy Riot poster, and then it started getting written up in the news as being made by Madonna. It's very hard online to keep provenance, though um, the uh, reverse Google image search is actually really helping that. But yeah, some things, some things they catch on, they become memes, they go into the real world. People have done like burlesque shows based on my drawings. They've gotten all sorts of my stuff tattooed, usually badly. Um, oh, that, 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 that really always hurts an artist's heart when you see someone who like gets your stuff tattooed and like all the blacks aren't filled in, so bad. Um, they um they do their own art based on it right now i have like a lot of young people on tumblr who are trying to do stuff like in the molly crab apple style with all like the washes and the ink on top of it which i think is crazy cool um yeah the network the network eats all Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering how you would respond to that. Could you repeat it? Because it was hard to hear around the oh, corner. Oh, sorry. Um, I just said I was asking about uh, talking to journalists and the nature of subjectivity as having an inherent truth and whether or not uh, she ever gets any criticism about that from journalists who are like, you can't fact check it. It's not true. It's not journalism. Well, when I'm doing um, illustrative journalism, first of all, I, I work with a fact checker for all the written stuff and, you know, use the same, like, transcripts and everything that you know any other journalist would use um when i'm doing drawings like the ones that i did of guantanamo a lot of things i just can't take photo reference to back them up because photos aren't allowed in those spaces um but those things i hew as closely as possible to reality obviously the guards there don't have giant smiley faces over their faces but the reality is that there's censorship, and if you ignore that in your photography or if you ignore that in your writing, you're also cutting something out of it. You're cutting out the fact that you're not allowed to draw the guards' faces, and why? So I do, as much as conceivably possible, use the same rigor and fact-checking that any other journalist would, but when you draw something or even when you take a photo, there still has to be an editorial slant to it. Like the one that I posted um, from the Vietnam War, that photo is not dry and unemotional. That photo, it's objective, it happened, but the feelings that it produces are deeply subjective and personal things. And frankly, I, I don't think you can really, um, I don't think you can really interface with reality as, um, as if you were just a CCTV camera, and I don't even think a CCTV camera is objective. Who are you drawing your political art for when you're doing it? Like, who's your assumed audience? That's an interesting thing. So one of 
my problems with political art um, is that a lot of it draws from the same visual canon, which is this sort of constructivist Soviet black and red stuff, which, I mean, it's, it's awesome. It, that is like some of the golden age of graphic design stuff. But the problem is it's a really clear demographic and people know immediately like if it's meant for them or if it isn't. I wanted to make political art for people who care deeply about the world around them, but didn't feel like political aesthetics were for them you know, who might relate more to something that looks like a fairy tale or might relate more to something that looks like classical illustration than they would to something that looks like, you know, 1920s Soviet stuff. I mean, in some ways, I do. I do think it's co-optation. Like, like anytime someone would take my Pussy Riot thing and they would put it on, like, they would like use it for their T-shirt store and they would like t hashtag it like punk, glam, Russian, sexy, you know, T-shirt and like, you know, sell it on eBay with no political context. Like, I, I do feel like that is co-optation. Um, I think that. I think when commercial when commercial interests take art that was um, done for something either opposed or unrelated to them, and um, just use it without context, that that that's co-option. Um, also, political causes do it all the time. Um, we saw it during um, McCain's campaign when he was using all of these songs, and then the musicians were like, "Oh my God, stop using my song to interest Sarah Palin." But I also find that with the network, this sort of thing. Well, it's almost inevitable, and like I, I, I firmly believe you should fight back against it if your song is being used to introduce Sarah Palin. Um, I, I think that the that these things will happen because the world is intensely interconnected, and um, yeah, that that'd be that would be my short answer. That it exists, but it just happens so much, so much more. They're brilliant. And I'm wondering about, I'm wondering whether they understand the history of the diorama and whether we can sort of kind of revivify that, that kind of art, that kind of display of information and illustration. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Beehive Collective is, um, do, you, do you guys mostly know what the Beehive Collective is? Okay. 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 <laughs> Um, so the Beehive Collective does these incredibly um, detailed, almost like Victorian pen and ink looking, um, gigantic, like maybe the size of the wall drawings of um, about subjects like strip mining or um, environmental devastation in Mexico, like kind of like complicated subjects. And they use a language of allegorical um, like insects and animals to display it. And it's not done by one person, it's done by a large group, which is why it has this insane, like almost perfectionistic detail. And they actually go to all of the affected areas, like they'll go to Appalachia and they'll talk to locals about strip mining and they'll revise and revise their thing until locals think that it's a truthful, um, truthful representation of what's going on. And um, I think that the Beehive Collective is so powerful because they are using a way to tell really, really complicated stories that isn't dependent on language or literacy that anyone from anywhere in the world can understand. And um, I can't speak for them, like whether or not they know that history, but I think that um, they're working in a tradition that I mean, goes back to like religious tableaus in the Middle Ages that were meant to teach people Bible stories who couldn't read. And um, that it's an intensely it's an intensely important thing to do because it goes beyond language. I do, yes.
consciously. I, I always drew in a way to get beyond language. Like even when I was hanging out, when I was hanging out with street kids in Morocco, my Arabic was a travesty and um, they didn't really speak much English, but because I could draw them, we had something in common. Drawing has always been a way for me, not just to get past language, but to get into places that I wasn't supposed to. Uh, one of my first jobs was I worked as the house artist for this incredibly swank nightclub that never would have let me pass their velvet rope. But because I could draw people there, I was allowed in. That was like my, was like my lock pick. Art is totally a lock pick. or events that you've seen, other one or two that stand out as most jarring or most different, you know, more different than what you had expected before you got there? Uh, the Guantanamo stuff, definitely. Um, Guantanamo Bay is the most bizarre and jarring place I've ever been to in my life. It, um, it's a cheerful American town with like a McDonald's and a karaoke bar and a gift shop that is also next to this sort of horrific supermax prison that, um, at this point is mostly empty because they've you know gotten rid of most of the people so this like supermax prison where the full might of the u.s military is devoted to guarding 164 middle-aged guys most of whom have been cleared and um so when you go there there's like, like this ridiculous i want to almost say like pantomime of security culture there where like you're constantly being searched you're never allowed to walk around alone you have a big badge around your neck that says um military escort all times um, you know, everything is, everything is being watched and everything is being like done under this sort of like, we're around very dangerous people, but then it's also a small American town. It's exactly like North Korea, actually. That's, that, that's, that's actually something that other people have told me that the, the North, you know, the, those tours in North Korea that they take people on, that the Gitmo press tour sounds a lot like that, especially with all like the crazy euphemism. Talk a little bit about size. The network, for the most part, displays images at most sort of on a 19-inch monitor most yeah. of the time, and often much, much less. But you're working a lot of other artwork. He's natively drawn much bigger than that. So this is one of my frustrations. Um, I want to do art that's really, really big, um, mainly just because when art that's really, really big, it affects you differently. Um, you don't look at it you it surrounds you you know it um it's a totally sort of it's a totally sort of different and almost like dominating um relationship but the problem is that thing doesn't it just doesn't reproduce online um i spoke a while ago at the london school of economics about uh, diego rivera and frida kahlo and diego in his lifetime was massively more successful than frida but frida now is massively more well known than diego and a large part of that is that to get why Diego is cool, you actually have to like go and stand in front of his murals and be like, holy shit, I'm in this entire world of Diego Rivera. Oh my God. Whereas like Frida's stuff, you can just put them on Tumblr and you immediately get what's awesome about them. And there's a lot of benefits to seeing them in real life, but they reproduce really well. So one of my frustrations is I want to do this really big work, but I want a way for it to have a digital life that's interesting. And that isn't just like, you know, having a large shot that's shrunk, that's shrunk down online that like no one can see the details of and then having detail shots. Cause to me like that's so dull. That's like, you know, looking at postage stamps of things. So yeah, I almost want to put this question out to you guys. How do you take really, really, really big work and give it a digital life that's somewhere as interesting as its physical life is? Microsoft like came out with the, um, the panorama, the stitcher. It's like a panorama stitcher, uh, and it allows you to like see um, different parts of the world like in a full like 360 view. By the way, other people have been taking pictures of it. Yeah. So doing something like that, where you can actually um, and and it's like infinitely scalable, so you can go all the way back and then, you know, to, to like a global look at the Eiffel Tower, but then you can zoom all the way in to like the actual individual beams. Um, That's so cool. They've done the eight split. Uh, they, they've done the digital edition of the eight split, which is of course too big to uh, exhibit anywhere. Yeah, there, there are lots of gigapans, which are amazing. Um, and in a somewhat similar thread, Dorkbot in Seattle did an exhibition with 
one of the art museums there where they took most of their uh, archive and they had a massive room that no one could go into, but they had a robot that you could guide in the, in the museum. And so you only had a very close up shot at any point in time, but you could move around and it was this massive collection. And then they also did a visualization of what people spent the most time on. That's so cool. And it was mostly eyes and frames. It was really, yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> well, in a related way, do you see, what is the difference for you between the, uh, what does it mean to be standing in front of the actual physical object that you drew? What, is it, what do you think it means to um, viewers, people who are looking at your art? I think that there's something fun to... No, it, no, it, and it can't digitize it. Well, I think that there's just like a fundamental like human reaction when you're standing in something bigger in front of something bigger than you. You know, like you look at it differently. Like you can like stick your face right up to it and like see all these little things. And then you can like step back and, but mostly it it surrounds you. Um, when I did Shell Game, I did nine paintings that were each about six feet tall, and I put them all in a room and once you went into that room, like there was nothing but my work. And like, I think it's the egomaniac and artists that we want to do this. Like there, like there's this like megalomaniacal thing where, where, where we're all like, no, now you have to enter into my world. You can't, you know, tune me out. And, um, I think, I think that that's, that's really where they were a bit of where the compulsion is. And also when I make those large paintings, I feel like I'm falling into them. I mean, I, I'll spend like 15 hours a day on those things. And like, I won't like bathe or eat or like, you know, be a human. I'll just sort of be this like communal, this like art beast in front of the painting. And um, I, I find that I can do that less with small paintings than I can with something that's actually bigger than I am. That's why I was thinking like the zooming quality of it yeah. would be really cool because every time I like go to look at a painting, you know, you start and you kind of like take it in and all of its glory, but then you want to see how all the parts work together. Um, and that's something you don't always get on, like if you're on my size screen, but having that ability to go in like little pieces of the whole and really examine each one might provide the experience that you're looking for. I think that that's really cool. I'm also thinking of um, when I, because I'm, I'm, oh, I guess I'll tell you guys. So my next project is going to be like a shell game type show with those giant paintings, but it's going to be all about hackers and surveillance, but using the same sort of allegorical language. And I want to do a painting that's 20 feet wide for it. And so I really, I'm really trying to puzzle out, like, how do I make the 20 foot wide painting? Like, how do I give it a digital life? Because, I mean, it would be some bullshit to do, to do something about the network and not have it exist on the network. You know what I mean? In a way that was interesting. You could always find, like, a new media artist, too, and do, I mean, maybe not just the painting, but, yeah. like, make an entire piece out of it that lives online because that's a really interactive thing like a shell game is something you can do yeah. so you know instead of just putting the static image online find a way to to work with it so that people can actually interact with the concept itself so i asked my question really badly although you answered it really <laughs> it was a really interesting answer um is there something about the physical object itself that necessarily even even if you find the perfect way of doing a gigapan or yeah. Um, is there something about being in the presence of the physical object itself that you think has value to uh, viewers? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, not the least of which because your own body is relating to it, you know, because like the physical object's there, but you're there also. And that's kind of what I was talking about with size. Like you feel yourself, like it feels different physically to be in, in front of something that's bigger than you or in something that surrounds you. And that, 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 um, you know, you're not just engaging it with your eyes, but kind of like with your with your whole self. Also, there are just things you just can't see online. Like, um, there's this amazing paint I use. It's called Zinc White. It's like super toxic, and it, no, it's it's like horrible. Like, I, I live in fear of this, but it's so beautiful, so I keep using it. And it's like this super transparent, warm white that like does these really good glazes. And when you, when when you look at it in person, like you can kind of see through it. It's so pretty. But um, it just doesn't reproduce in photos. Like it, that, that's just not what it is. It's something that you actually have to like see on a piece of wood, you know, with layers of it. And um, yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of art that um, you can't get in person, um, or that you can't get you can't get on the internet, or that you can't get from photos. And um, I think sometimes because we have these amazing machines that have the sum total of human knowledge in them, we forget that actually there are all sorts of things that you actually just have to physically be there and look at them in person. It's, it's interesting to me, um, because of that, because that's kind of ineluctable I and mean, you just can't get away from that, 
the ways in which that experience gets kind of remediated and ported back out to the network. I'm thinking about you know so many of my friends who got to see the James Terrell exhibit at the Guggenheim. I never got to get there, and I was just being tantalized constantly <laughs> by you know Instagram and and vines and tweets that showed them in the space, showed them interacting with the with the space, and because it was so not Terrell, what was happening on the screen in a way because it, you know, because those pieces can't can't be uh, reproduced on a mobile device, um, it, it somehow underscored um, the fact that they can't be produced on a mobile device. And I want to ask a question about the photography versus the artist perspective. So there are some places that still you can't bring cameras into, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, the, the courtroom is one Supreme Court being, being version of that. Do you have a comment on sort of the misguided nature of that prohibition, especially since I hear you saying, and I agree, that sketch artists or artists generally can be much more subversive than photographs. I, I don't actually understand why they don't allow cameras. Um, it, it almost feels to me like it's one of these like rules from way back where like cameras smoked and had flashes and stuff and then because it's bureaucracy it just like never it never got fixed i mean we're still like turning off our cell our cell phones in the in the airplanes too um i think i do think that's some of it um i know with the ksm courtroom the big problem that they had was that there were these cameras that were all over the ceiling and they didn't want um they didn't want any of their own cameras shown in pictures or any of the doors or anyone's faces so it would actually have been like impossible to have gotten you know like a picture of the court with a with a photo um also because they wouldn't like let you smudge out things like they would they they it, they would just delete things there so it would have been impossible to get photos um that rep that conform to all of their like bizarre opsec things um I, I do think it's misguided but i'm also happy it exists because it, it allows one place where like my people can still be king <laughs> Thinking about optics and where some people are king, do you ever encounter people who feel trapped but are themselves willing to draw to capture things that they can send out? I feel like, yeah, I, I, I didn't, I don't think I heard you well. Have you, have you met people who are trying to learn to draw so that they can capture things that they can send out that are perhaps harder to censor? easier ways for them to share the emotional experience of where they are. I think a very classic um, thing with that would be uh, prison art. Um, many people um, who are in prison throughout the world um, learn to draw as a way to, um, to express themselves there. Um, this guy that I profiled for Vice magazine, uh, who's a Guantanamo detainee who's now free, uh, he learned to draw when he was in prison, kind of for that reason. Role there in is, is there you know is there is there is there something to be said for you know um, providing a space for people to think about editorial art um, um, in the way that you've done already with Doctor Sketchy? I think the the primary thing with art is um, you just have to learn how to do it and then you decide what you want to say with it. Um, it's like you know if you were like learning to run like once you learn how to where once you learn how to run where you go to is kind of up to you. Um, so what Dr. Sketchies does is it's, um, my sort of alternative drawing class that like, you know, is in a bar with like drag queens and glamorous subversive models. And it's done like in a very irreverent, informal way. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to people to learn to draw. And I also wanted, um, people to have permission to look because artists, we get to be the most socially acceptable creeps ever. We're allowed to like totally stare at people all the time. Like, and then be like, look, I drew you. <laughs> Um, whereas, like, for instance, when I was growing up, I never felt like I could look around while I was walking down the street because I would get so much street harassment. Like, I would constantly have to, like, look down and, like, you know, turn, like, tune myself off because, just because of harassment. And, um, drawing was a way that I was allowed to look, where me looking wasn't, like, taken as invitation, it was taken as something else. Thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting. Right? And all of your work. I'm, I'm curious about 
know, I, some of Susan Sontag's questions that she raises in the Holding the Pain of Others about how so many people have thought that showing violence <coughs> might prompt uh, movements towards peace. Do, do you feel like it's different with drawings? Like, the, one of the things she points out is that images of violence can end up provoking more violence, even though that wasn't the intent of the photographer. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I mean, there are a few things there. Um, the classic way that images of violence provoke more violence is when, like, pictures of atrocities, you know, urge another country onto war or um, lead to, like, an unending spiral of revenge. But there's also just the way that they desen desensitize people. I maintain faith that drawings can still shock and um, get past people's defenses. Like, that Otto Dix p picture of the person with the skin graft, I think the way he did it and the way he focused on what it is I, I like to think gets beyond that. Like, I, I don't think something like that would lead to more violence necessarily the way that like blood gore, you know, will, but maybe I'm just hopeful for my own medium. That out of this picture, when you showed that, it reminded me very much of the picture that's going around the internet right now, the Chinese man with the nose going on his, on his forehead, which I thought was an interesting juxtaposition to, to launch into my mind. I, maybe there's nothing there, but you know that's that's just the reaction that I had to that particular image. It's interesting. I haven't I haven't actually seen this this photo. Picasso God, photo of an actual Picasso. IRL Picasso. Right. He's just got a nose growing out of his forehead. Awesome. Well, I are we. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys.